Hey, my name is Matt Storr, and I repair saxophones for a living. Today, I would like to show you the Con Conqueror saxophones. That is the Con 30M and the 26M. Uh, this is a 30M, and these saxophones are basically the 10M and the 6M uh, with many uh, mechanical improvements, or depending on your point of view, elaborations. Um, the these saxophones were made between serial number 263,000 and uh, 309,000, that is 1935 to 1942, and uh, so that's all pre-war. Uh, for the purposes of speaking about con saxophone production, uh, normal saxophone production, although the war had started uh, for the United States in 1941, their saxophone production uh, didn't change uh, as a result of war acts until uh, 1942, as I went over in my previous Con 10M video. Um, and I'm not going to talk about a lot of the things uh, that are similar between this horn and the 10M, or in the case of the 26M, uh, that are similar between these horns and their uh, brothers, the 10M and 6M. So, it, ideally what you would do is watch the 10M video or the 6M video and then watch this video to see what makes these horns different rather than what makes them the same. So, the 30M. So, I just finished overhauling uh, this one. I've overhauled a few of these Conquerors, which, by the way, is spelled C-O-N-N-Q-U-E-R-O-R. Uh, a play on words, which if you ever talk to someone who's a fan of cons, uh, doesn't really take that long to develop. Um, they will soon be convinced that, you know, you need to continue playing cons and stuff like that. So, um, con themselves was not uh, above a few puns. Even on the earlier versions of these, engraving the word conqueror uh, on the bell. But that engraving disappeared uh, as time went on. And speaking of engraving, you should be able to see that this is a more elaborate version of the engraving that you would find on a 10M. Um, and also, interesting to note, the hair on the ladies in the Pent Pentagon um, is always frizzy, as far as I can tell. It's got a lot more texture than it does on the uh, 6M and 10M. For example, here is a 6M, and you can see what the engraving looks like on a 6M pattern. This is a transitional, so this will be slightly smaller uh, in area than the later 6Ms, but you can see what the lady looks like. She's got lines for hair, right? And then a 26M, which is the Conqueror version. You can see the engraving is more elaborate, um, and the lady has textured hair. In this case, on this particular instrument, it looks like it's tied back behind her neck, which is interesting. Although I, I don't think meaningful. People tend to ascribe, you know, meaning to the way the lady looks, but I'm not sure that that really has much to do with it. Given that the engravers that did this uh, engraved every con instrument. Um, or most of them, they were very, very busy doing engraving. I don't think they were playtesting each horn and trying to ascri uh, you know, ascribe qualities of uh, the instrument to the hairstyle of the lady, although you will find people who believe that is true. So, aside from more elaborate engraving, what made these instruments different than the 6M and the 10M? And again, you should watch the 10M video to see what makes a 10M a 10M. And then this is kind of extra stuff on top of a 10M. Now, the body tube is the same. If you look at their original advertising literature, uh, the way they talk about these instruments is basically th they call the 10M and the 6M the standard saxophones, and these are the uh, conqueror saxophones. And all they talk about, they talk about the same great tone, the same intonation, the same, 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 whenever they're talking about things that have to do with the bore, okay? Um, that is actually the same. You can take a 10M neck, and you can uh, put it on a 30M and it'll work. You can take a 6M neck and put it on a 26M and it works. And you can change them back and forth. And the only difference uh, is the difference between individual necks and individual horns. 
30 amps do not, as a rule, play better than 10 amps. 26 amps do not, as a rule, play better than 6 amps. Um, the, the things that are actually different is all in the mechanics. And basically, what it seems like they did, from my perspective when I work on these horns, it seems like they gave someone like me uh, a room, a lot of time, and a lot more leeway than someone would typically be given. And these saxophones uh, took a very expensive to make, time consuming to make, um, delicate but brilliant solution to the problem of basically cork compression, right? So, and the way they did this was by what they call perma-just feet, okay? And that is the main difference on these saxophones. You see these little guys here? Okay, so you can see where the key foot there is touching the body. You've got this little sphere on the end of the key arm and then inside it is a set screw which you can look at my set screw video to get an idea of what you'll run into dealing with those. Um, and then a little uh, disc-like foot that touches the body. And on the body, there's a little ring soldered onto the body, within which, uh, since I've overhauled this one, is synthetic felt. And what this is, is an adjustment mechanism, and you can see it's even on the bar key here. Pretty much everywhere uh, where there is an adjustment that would normally have cork on an old instrument, um, or on a normal instrument, where the cork can compress and throw things out of alignment. You have these perma-just action uh, feet. There's 12 of them on the instrument. And in the original literature, they talk about how cork compresses over time and you have to have adjustments made. For instance, okay, see when I press this key, how this is moving as well. So for these two to act together, there's a piece of adjustment material right in here that if that compresses, then this key is not going to move as far as it should, right? So the way Khan wanted to get over that was since everyone was using cork for these adjustments back then, since they didn't have synthetic materials like we do now that don't compress, was they made it really easy for you to adjust this on the fly. And the way you do that is you unscrew the set screw and then you take a spring you can see this little hole here. Hopefully this is focusing. See this little hole here in the disc? You take a spring and you put it in there and, and you screw it in and out. And this disc screws in and out and that's how you do your adjustments. And then you put the locking screw back in. Again, uh, check out my locking screw video which was published just previous to this one um, to see the kind of stuff you run into there. But basically, when you overhaul these instruments, you put your felt on first. In my case, synthetic felt and then you adjust these feet so that everything uh, is working properly. And in practice, it actually works really, really well. Um, the only issue is that, as you can probably see, it's a very small, very delicate mechanism, and you've got tons of little pieces in there. And if the instruments are not well cared for, uh, cared for or if they've been damaged, or if they've been allowed to sit in a human environment for a while, or uh, if the instrument has been re-lacquered, um, which is, you know, another kind of insidious form of damage given that you have to buff it. Um, this mechanism can be loose, it can be missing pieces, it can be uh, bound, you know, it can be locked up and rusted, and it can be very difficult to get everything apart, get everything clean, to get everything working properly. Now this instrument um, had been sitting for a very long time. As you can see, it's in really, really nice shape. Uh, but it still took me about twice as long as a normal overhaul because of all these little bits and pieces that you have to take out, uh, clean, make sure they're operating correctly, uh, oil, and then put together correctly. But once you do, uh, the instrument feels great under the fingers. So the perma-just action, you can see it, you've got one here, one here, one, two, three. So that's for the upper stack. You've got five perma-just feet on the upper stack. Um, and then on the lower stack, it's a little harder to see probably, you've got one, two, three on the key feet, and then one, two for the F sharp, for the bar key, which is over the top of the lower stack rather than on the back and behind like you might normally see, or like you pretty much always see. 
And then you've got a lot of these uh, permajust feet buried inside the left-hand pinky table here, which is uh, also completely changed from the 10M, 26M. And uh, the way they did that, it's kind of hard to see, but if you look down in here, you see these post feet here. These are not normally present on a 10M or a 6M. And what those are is those are the pivots, those are the hinge rods where the left hand pinky table pivots, okay? So instead of having the left hand pinky table move kind of this way, like they normally do, everything moves straight up and down on these hinge tubes here, which you can see on the G-sharp, or sorry, when I move the B-flat, they all move together. And it's kind of an unusual uh, arrangement, and when you take apart the instrument, and when you put the instrument back together, it is going to be in a different order than you're used to, because everything kind of gets in the way of these. Um, and herein lies some of the major challenges when you're working with a 30M or 26M. Um, this left-hand pinky table is rather complicated, rather complex, and very different from anything else you're going to see. When I move this C-sharp here, there are actually five different keys moving at once. And you've got lots of different linkages where everything is working together. And you should be able to see here, so all I'm going to do is press the C-sharp, watch right here and right here, and you'll get to see a couple of these linkages in play. And then on the back side, if you watch right here, you can see another of those linkages in play. Oops, gravity. So making this feel really good and really tight, I mean, you can see here, you see me touch it. It's very easy, quiet, right? Everything's smooth, everything's moving at the same time. Um, and that is extremely difficult to accomplish uh, on these instruments. It just takes time. It just takes a lot of patience and attention and getting all of your adjustment materials correct so that they can slide against each other because these are all sliding linkages. It may not look or sound like it, but these are all sliding linkages going together and you've got an awful lot of brass moving from just this tiny little bit of pressure I'm applying here. And uh, even if I do say so myself, um, if you can make a 30M look and feel like I did on this one, um, then chances are you're a pretty good repairman. Uh, it's very difficult to accomplish, um, and unless you've been taught by someone who made one of these, um, which is highly unlikely, it's somewhat difficult just to figure out on your own. Uh, and it's very easy to make a mistake or a misstep. And then these horns feel really bad under the fingers. So this is actually one of the saxophones I use when I talk to people about, you know, uh, my specialty is vintage saxophones. It's all, really all I do. I do vintage and professional saxophones. Um, but given that most modern saxophones don't need full overhauls yet, I see those less than I see stuff like this. Um, most modern saxophone designs are based on the Selmer Mark VI, right? So if you've got a Selmer Mark VI and you take it to pretty much any saxophone repairman, they've seen something extremely similar. The Mark VI is also built in such a way that you can basically, you know, throw the pieces in a bag, shake it, and you're halfway done. It's very, very intuitive. It's very easy to work on. Um, the 30M and the 26M are the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And unless you do everything perfectly, they're going to feel like crap under the fingers. They're not going to play right. So you've got this massive investment in a beautiful saxophone, a beautiful rare saxophone. Um, and unless you take it to someone who is very good at the Con 30M and Con 26M, you're not going to get good results. So it's best to take these type of horns, in particular to someone such as myself, there are others out there, I'm obviously not the only guy, uh, that can put these together well. Um, but unfortunately, people like that are few and far between, probably because there's not a ton of these horns out there. I mean, they're only made between serial number 263,000 and 309,000, um, and then they stopped and never came back in production after World War II. Um, so there's just not a ton of these out there. So there's not, you know, an incentive for most people to learn how to repair these well. It just so happens that it's my passion 
to work on vintage saxophones. So whether or not it's financially reasonable or not, um, you know, I tend to search out uh, unusual things uh, for myself uh, and from other people uh, and learn how to fix them, which gave me the reputation I have now, which means I see more of this stuff. So it's kind of building on itself to where I see more of these things than most people do. Um, so when you get a 30M and you get everything set up really correctly, you can have extremely light and fast action that is very firm and positive. And the left hand pinky table, although the angle at which it actuates, which you can see here pretty well, um, is different than normal. It goes straight up and down instead of kind of across. It's actually very comfortable. But if you play a 30M or a 26M and it's not comfortable and it feels gummy, that's a problem of setup. That is not a problem of the design of the horn. Um, another thing you might notice about the design of the horn is that you've got sterling silver inlaid key touches uh, everywhere there is not a pearl, right? So um, that is a feature of the 30M, 26M, and what that is for is to keep those touch pieces looking beautiful uh, even as you wear them over time. Uh, the very thick inlay, you would take, I mean, I don't think anyone could really actually wear through them. You can see how thick they are on the side here. And they even put these on the plated horns. Most often you'll see these in lacquer, but there are silver plate examples, and there's even a few gold plated examples. And they did do the inlay before plating. So even if you've got a plated 30M, 26M, you've got sterling silver inlay on the key touches. And anywhere there isn't sterling silver, there's a pearl. So everywhere you touch the instrument to play it, there is a piece of material specifically on there uh, for you to touch. Another interesting thing is this mechanism for the, which they actually don't talk about in the advertising literature, but works pretty well for the bis adjustment here, right? So you've got one of these permadjust key feet. And then above the bis, you've got a long screw that is found nowhere else on the saxophone with a locking screw here and a flat spring on the bottom. And you back out this locking screw and you can screw this in or out and it pushes that flat spring down, which gives a nice uh, smooth bearing surface for the adjustment on the bis. And that actually works really, really nice. I like it. Um, another thing they talked about was uh, a redesigned octave mechanism. But if you've seen a 10M, this is going to look really familiar to you. That's probably because they kind of put it on all their saxophones at once, but in their advertising literature, uh, you know, they said it was a special feature. Um, but all the 6Ms and the 26Ms uh, have the same octave mechanism, pretty much. Except for, so you'll see on the tenor neck here, you've got this really beautiful overslung octave key, which is also the first place that you see that cone-shaped pip that you see on later 10Ms. Um, the really beautiful, I love the design on this. It's not really, you know, honestly, mechanically the best design um, when it's been bent or kind of bent out of shape or, or damaged. It's really difficult to get back into shape but it just looks so beautiful. And they actually, they did this on the Alto as well. Now the Alto I have, so this is the neck from the 26M I have, is the regular 6M style. Although you notice it has the, let's see if it'll focus, the eight stamp on the tenon skirt there. Um, as far as I can tell, uh, most of the 26Ms, until you get into the later ones, had the uh, eight stamp on both the neck and the body. You can see it right there, 26M VIII. And the earlier ones seem to have the standard M stamp on the neck. But like I was saying, the octave mechanism on the 26M and the 30M looks very much like what you see on the uh, 6M and uh, 10M. Unless on the Alto, you actually could get a neck that looked very much like this one in that it was overslung and it had the same uh, key here and it usually didn't have a micro tuner. I've heard people say that there were overslung alto necks with a micro tuner. I haven't seen one. Um, in which case your octave mechanism will look a little different. Now I'm going to show you what it would have looked like. This is not a 26M but this is the first place that they had this type of octave mechanism. This is on a Con 6M transitional with an overslung, aka New York neck, right? And that's actually the original um, neck protector right there. 
So it looks a lot like the 6M mechanism, but it lifts this up instead of pushing it towards the body, right? So you see when I use this here, see the way that's moving? And then if I take the 26M, it moves the opposite direction. So if you've got a 26M with an overslung neck, it can only use the overslung neck. If you've got a 26M with an underslung neck, it can only use the underslung neck. Um, but those necks are interchangeable, right? So if I had a regular 6M with an underslung neck, I could put that neck on here, it would work no problem. If I had a 26M with an overslung neck, I could take that New York neck off the other horn and put it on there, no problem. But it has to be overslung or underslung. Can't switch between the two. Okay, so um, that is about it for the 26M, 30M uh, series. Uh, they're basically 6Ms as far as playing goes, um, with a lot of bells and whistles. Um, not all of which are strictly necessary, but they're all very cool. And when the horn is put together right, uh, it feels really, really good under the fingers. Um, 6Ms and 10Ms, I think, feel great to start with, but then you add the improvements they put into these instruments, um, and you've got something really, really special. Uh, and you can also see here on the 26M, the shape of the cluster is also slightly different than you find on uh, the 6M, but ever so slightly. But it's also got those, you know, cross hinges, and this moves up and down. Oh, look at that. It's even got like a sterling. Uh, liar screw on this 26M. So basically, what these horns represent is uh, Khan really just kind of going all out and doing what they were capable of rather than strictly what was reasonable. Um, and given my passion for the saxophone, um, I love that. I, th I just think these are so cool. I'm not sure... Um, I mean, this one, this 26M is mine. This is an overhaul I just completed for a customer. Um, I'm not sure that I would ever own one. I mean, I, I barely, I usually don't own saxophones for very long. I do a lot of buying and selling, and, you know, I just, I just kind of collect them, and then I let them go when I get bored. But I think, eventually, uh, a 26M or a 30M is going to be in my permanent collection, just because they're so unique in the way they were built. Nothing else is, is really like this. You've got other horns that have, uh, you know, unique um, approaches to uh, solving problems um, with key work and adjustments and making everything, you know, stay in adjustment for a long time um, and taking more power and putting it into the hands of the player. Since you can adjust these with a small screwdriver and a spring, um, if you have the mechanical wherewithal to understand how this mechanism works. Um, you don't need uh, adjustment materials, you don't need uh, glues, you just need a spring and a screwdriver once it's put together. Um, but no one else really approached it like Khan did for these instruments, and they're very special that way, and you know, they play like a good 10M or like a good 6M, which are some of the best saxophones ever made. So you've got one of the best body tubes ever made, one of the best sounds you're going to find anywhere, um, with truly unique, uh, wonderful keywork on it that is basically the, you know, the apotheosis of American craftsmanship uh, in saxophone making, which, uh, you know, that's hard to beat, and it's something I really enjoy uh, working on, and something that if you get one and you get it put together properly, you will enjoy playing and enjoy owning. So, hope this was helpful, useful, informative. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. Today I showed you two beautiful examples of uh, pre-war American craftsmanship with the Con 30M and the Con 26M. Um, this is 1942 and this is 1940. And these were made from 1935 to 1942. Um, I will say, if you want to buy one of these, try and find one that's in really good physical shape. Um, when these get banged up or relacquered, or if they've really been through a lot, um, they are a bear to work on, uh, which translates into either uh, extremely expensive for you, 
or uh, not a good result. Or uh, worst case scenario, you spend a lot of money and you still don't like the result. Um, one of the first one of these I worked on, actually the first one I worked on, was a 26M that had been relacquered three times, uh, belonged to the original owner who bought it new when he was a kid in New York City, and he was 90 at the time, and he was still gigging on it. Um, so that was a labor of love, and that took me quite a while, and that really broke me in on these. Um, I had to make a lot of parts, a lot of these little screws will end up going missing. Um, the little adjustment discs on the perma-adjust feet uh, tend to get banged up or bent or missing over time, um, depending on the skill of the repairman. People will just r replace them with some random screw. Um, so that can be extremely time-consuming uh, and difficult if these are not in clean physical shape. So I would advise you to start with one that is in clean physical shape uh, if you want to own one of these, because it's um, even more important than on most other saxophones due to the complexity of the mechanism. All right, and actually uh, this one, although I'm really thinking about keeping it, is currently for sale on my website. It's awaiting an overhaul. It has its original pads in it um, right now, and this is original finish. Um, but like I said, I'm really consider keeping it. I, I don't really want to sell it, at least not yet. So that's it for today. Thanks for watching.